Welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. My name is Kate, and today we are going to continue our discussion about the Vestals, who are the priestesses of Vesta in ancient Rome. This is part two of this discussion, so if you haven't seen the first part, I will link it down below. Today we're going to get more into the Vestals themselves, the process that you go through to become a Vestal, what your life is like while you're a Vestal, and then what happens to you when you finish your term of service to the goddess. So with all that being said, let's get right into it. So how do you become a Vestal Virgin? So under normal circumstances, new Vestals would be selected when one of the existing Vestals ages out. I'll talk about the terms of service in just a minute, but it's not a permanent position. So when your position is done, you leave the college and someone else has to come in and take your place. So in the beginning, the girls that were selected to become Vestals only came from noble aristocratic families. Prestige was very important. Yes, tangible power, money, positions of authority in government, those things were important but it was also a cultural power that your family had to have. If you live in New England and you're related to John Adams, it doesn't mean anything technically, but it means something culturally. So in the beginning, Vestals were chosen from these kinds of families that had that hereditary prestige. But because the terms of service for Vestal virgins were so long, it was 30 years, it was a very tall order to ask families to give up their daughters for three decades. So the pool of potential Vestals was eventually expanded to include everybody. So that's regular common people and even um, freed people, people who used to be in slavery who have now become free citizens of Rome. Anybody's daughter could become a Vestal. Um, and this was a sort of practical issue that, that Rome had to solve. The girls that were considered for the position of Vestal were quite young, typically between the ages of six and 10. And like I said, their period of service lasted for 30 years. In order to become a Vestal, you had to undergo a series of tests. They had to make sure that you were a good fit for the position. And that means things that probably shouldn't matter, like your physical appearance. The Romans were very concerned about what they considered to be physical defects. If you walk with a limp or you speak with a stutter or you have a peculiar birthmark or some other physical characteristic that was deviant enough from the norm that the Romans were concerned about it because they were concerned about these things, this was something that might disqualify you from becoming a Vestal. In addition to physical characteristics, mental and emotional characteristics as well had to be considered. And again, I'm not endorsing any of this. I'm just saying this is how they did it. You had to be perfect and pure and all of that. So once you are selected as a Vestal, you go to the temple, which is where the Vestals live in the, in the temple complex, and you spend the next 30 years living there. You take a vow of chastity. I talked about the chastity thing in the last episode. Immediately you were under the protection of the goddess and you also were expected to begin your service to the goddess right away. So that's the normal way that somebody becomes a Vestal. Under extraordinary circumstances, if an existing Vestal dies unexpectedly or something happens, the rules for things like age and stuff like that no longer applied. So you didn't have to be a small child. You could be an older woman. You could even have been married before. You didn't have to be a virgin. You didn't have to be pure. You just had to get somebody in there really quickly. It was considered bad luck to have a Vestal be like, a divorcee, for example, but if that was someone who was willing to give themselves to the goddess for 30 years, then 
that was who was selected. The College of Vestals was actually quite small. At its largest, it was probably only ever six people. So because there were not that many Vestals and because the terms of service were so long, the process of selecting a Vestal didn't actually happen all that often and it was kind of an extraordinary event. We have a new Vestal this year that hasn't happened in, it, it could be 15, 20 years. Also a huge honor for the family. It kind of sucks because you lose your child for 30 years the big understatement there. At the same time, you are doing such a service to the state that you're held in, in high regard everywhere you go. And your daughter is held in even higher regard than you are because she is actually directly communicating with the goddess and she is helping to ensure the survival of the Roman state. Anywhere she goes, even after her term of service comes to an end, She's gonna be treated well, she's gonna be respected, she's gonna be taken care of. So what was daily life like for a Vestal Virgin? The Vestals lived in a place which is called the House of the Vestals, the Atria Vestae, literally the Halls of Vesta, which was attached to the Temple of Vesta in the Roman Forum, the city center, the marketplace. So you lived in sort of the center of Rome's public life, but because keeping your purity, keeping your modesty was so important, you spent a lot of time in the complex itself. It was this massive complex, tons and tons of rooms. And like I said, there were only over six women living there. So you had a lot of space to spread out. It wasn't like the Vestals couldn't go anywhere. They did go lots of places. They traveled around the city quite a bit doing different duties and tasks they were consulted on religious matters, important state matters, because again, religion and state are one and the same. So they wouldn't be stuck inside the temple complex, but they would spend most of their time there tending to the eternal flame and carrying out the other duties as expected of them. Every priestly college had its own unique attire and the Vestals were no different. I've seen a lot of comparisons between what the Vestals wore and what Roman brides wore, which is interesting in itself because of the whole virginity thing. But I think in this case, we can get a little too attached to that comparison. In modern American society, for example, you have wedding dresses and you have prom dresses, and sometimes they look very similar. The colors might be different. There might be different features but they are both formal wear for young American women, typically. I think that what's happening with the outfits that the Vestals wore and Roman bridal costumes, I think this is sort of like a wedding prom dress thing where they look similar because they're both formal, they're both religious in this case, Roman marriage, very, very religious. But that doesn't mean that one follows from the other, and I think it's a mistake to assume that these things should be taken together or should be considered against each other. I, I think that's going a little too far. So the Vestals dressed typically for Roman women. They would have had some kind of tunic as an undergarment, and then they would have covered it with a dress called a stola, a stola was just a typical Roman matrona dress. Uh, it was tied at the shoulders with these things called fibulae, which are like safety pins. They're, they're quite large and they can be decorative. So more along the lines of your grandma's brooches, if anybody remembers that. And they were tied with two belts across the middle to create pleats and folding. Um, so there was a lot of drapery happening. They also wore a thing called a palo, which is like a cloak. They would drape that over one arm. The Vestals would have worn red and white ribbons in their hair called infuli. Uh, the red symbolized the fire of Vesta's eternal hearth flame and the white symbolized chastity and purity and the Vestals commitment to that. They also would have had these things in their hair called witai. Now I'm going to link in the description an awesome video there is a hairdresser slash archeologist named Janet Stevens, and she has been recreating ancient hairstyles on YouTube for a long time now. She has one on the Vestals, I'll put it down below. It's really good, go and check that out. The Vestals also wore a veil called a syphibulum, and this was unique to them. No one else wore this syphibulum, so this is a way that you could distinctly tell when a Vestal is 
going through town, oh, that person is a Vestal, I can tell from the Cephibulum. So that's what the Vestals typically wore. Again, it's unique in some ways, but in other ways, it is just a variation of traditional Roman women's clothing. So the Vestals had a very privileged position in Roman society. They were given a lot of special things uh, to make up for the fact that they had to be in the service of the goddess for 30 years. What I think is the most notable is the sacrosanctity of their bodies. There were only a few people in Rome that were specifically sacrosanct. So it was illegal to kill a Roman citizen, but there were only a few government offices, the Vestals being one. The Vestals had the right of sacrosanctity, which meant that their body was religiously holy, and if you touched it or hurt it in any way, that would be not only a legal offense, it was a religious offense as well. So the Vestals had this and the Tribune of the Plebs also had this, which meant that if you were attacked, if you were hurt in some way by someone, that person would not only have to answer to legal consequence, but also religious consequence as well. So this meant that nobody wanted to hurt the Vestals because the punishment for them would be so severe. Anyone who attacked a Vestal, hurt a Vestal, killed a Vestal, which I don't think ever happened in recorded history, uh, they would immediately be put to death. If you are a Vestal, you can walk around in relative comfort, understanding that it is not in people's best interest to hurt you. The Vestals didn't have to walk anywhere. They were too holy for the mean streets of Rome. I mean, Roman streets literally had like rivers of poop running down them, so the Vestals were not like trying to get involved in that. So they were taken around in a carpentum, which is like a carriage. Everywhere they went, they never had to walk anywhere. The Vestals were also given the power to free slaves and convicted criminals just by touching them. So if you are walking down the street and you see a Vestal, you can petition the Vestal like, hey, I'm on trial for such and such and I'm up against the death penalty. If they put a hand on you, if they touch you, that means that you cannot be prosecuted, you are officially pardoned, and you can go on your way and live your life. So the Vestals had very high power in that regard. So I've already talked about the main function of the Vestals, which is to guard the eternal flame. Again, I talked about that in part one. The Vestals were responsible for keeping this fire going at all times, but the Vestals also had a number of other responsibilities within the city as well. In terms of religious duties, they were responsible for guarding this thing called the Palladium, which was a very, very sacred object. It allegedly came from Troy. The Romans traced their ancestry back to Troy, the famous Troy of the Trojan War. Troy fell. Certain people left Troy, came over, founded cities in Italy that gave rise to Rome. So the Romans believed that this image had come from Troy and the Vestals were responsible for guarding this. You can compare this almost to Catholic reliquaries where you'd have like a little bit of the actual body of a saint, a piece of the saint's clothing or something that was kept in a little thing called a reliquary. I shouldn't say was, still is. It's special, it's significant, and you don't want anything bad to happen to it. This is like the Palladium. It's very, very ancient. It, it speaks to Rome's religious history. It speaks to Rome's cultural history. And the Vestals were in charge of keeping that safe within the temple complex. They were also in charge of other miscellaneous religious tasks and also to prepare this thing called the Mola Salsa which is a grain that was mixed with salt, and this was a part of every official sacrifice that Rome did. You have to begin by sprinkling this little barley meal on top of whatever it is you're sacrificing. So unfortunately, most of the time that means animals. The Vestals were in charge of preparing this. And then as government officials, one important thing that they were put in charge of was to keep safe 
wills, and other important documents. So those are the main duties of a Vestal Virgin. Take care of some of Rome's most ancient and important religious functions, as well as guarding public documents including the wills of important people. With great power comes great responsibility, and unfortunately for the Vestals, this means that the stakes were very high. Now, before I talk about the punishments that were given to Vestals who strayed from their duty, I just wanna say, I, I think a lot of the discussion of the Vestals tends to center around how brutal their punishments were. I'm not excusing this in any way. I don't think that these punishments were justified. I don't think that they were necessary, but I do wanna dwell on it for a minute because I think we can get caught up. I think we can get a little bit carried away when we talk about these punishments. So I wanna make two points about this. We know what the stakes were if the eternal flame went out. From a religious standpoint, it meant the end of Roman society. So they took it very seriously and in the way that only a Roman state could, they decided to come up with their best way to ensure that the eternal flame stayed lit. And in Roman fashion, that meant threat of extraordinary violence and cruelty. Violence was Rome's answer for pretty much everything. It was a militaristic society that used force to, for lack of a better word, enforce what it was trying to do. The Vestals were not the only ones up against things like death penalty, things like threats of, of bodily harm. So I think when we talk about Vestal punishment, we tend to say like, the Vestals had these horrible punishments as if they were the only ones, they just weren't. So that's my first point. The second point is that it didn't happen all that often. There are only six Vestals. Under normal circumstances, they last for 30 years in the priestesshood. So the number of times, I mean, we have, a bunch of anecdotes from the hundreds and hundreds of years of Roman history when Vestals were punished. But it was always recorded because it was always noteworthy. It was always something that like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe like a Vestal was put to death. Like that does not happen every day. It's important to talk about the punishments. It's important to say that they were bad because they were, but it didn't happen all that often and it wasn't unique in Rome's militaristic society. So I just wanted to point that out before we talk about the actual specifics of what these punishments were. So what were they? There were a few different punishments that the Vestals could be subjected to if they didn't do their duties properly. So the two main instances when a Vestal would be punished severely, if the eternal flame goes out and a Vestal is found to be at fault for that, however they decided to figure that out, she would be subjected to beating, whipping, whatever. I guess just based on the severity of the punishment, the worse crime of a Vestal, worse than the eternal flame going out, is if a Vestal broke her vow of chastity. I should point out that a Vestal could be found guilty of breaking her vow of chastity even if she was not at fault. What mattered was she was no longer a virgin. It did not matter how that happened. The blame was placed on the Vestal and the Vestal was punished. And the way that she was punished was she was put to death. But because it's Rome, they had to find a way to make it worse. Because a Vestal is sacrosanct, her body is religiously protected, it's against the law to spill Vestal blood. So you can't just execute a Vestal in any normal way. You cannot spill her blood. So the way that they would do it is they would bury her alive. But there's more. You can't just bury somebody inside the city alive or not. There were rules against this that had both a practical function, um, it's a sanitation issue, and also a religious function. You're not supposed to keep the dead inside the city. That's why in ancient cities, all of the cemeteries are outside the city walls. They didn't want to just kill her outright. So what they did was they would put her into a massive pit with enough food and water to last her a couple of days and then no longer after that. And this wasn't to prolong the punishment, it was to religiously absolve whoever was tasked with carrying out this order of the crime of killing a Vestal. You have to put her down there, put her with food. It's like, oh, I just, I gave her this weird little place to stay and she happened to die. You have to jump through all of these hoops to get through all of the different 
levels of laws and rules and scruples. It's very complicated, but the result is that the Vestal is put into a pit, she's given water and food for a couple of days, and then she is expected to die down there. Particularly terrible, particularly cruel and unusual, very Roman. It didn't happen that often. It's recorded a handful of times throughout the, the centuries of Roman history. Not excusing it, I'm just pointing out the fact that we should be grateful that it didn't happen all that often. So that's what life was like as a Vestal. Before we move on to what life was like after your terms of service as a Vestal were over, I want to make a very brief comparison to a living tradition that we can look at that there's, you know, video footage of. I'll put some links in the description so that you can see what I'm talking about, but I wanted to compare the Vestals to the worship of young girls in Nepal known as the Kumari goddesses. Similar to the Vestals, young girls are taken from their families for a period of time to perform religious functions. Now, of course, these things are different because the Vestals are priestesses of a goddess, Vesta, whereas the Kumari goddesses are worshiped as incarnations of the goddess. So there's a difference there, but in structure, the two traditions are very similar. The Kumari girls are selected at a young age. Like the Vestals, they have a lot of respect, a lot of privileges. They're carried around everywhere. Their feet are not allowed to touch the ground because their feet are sacred. Much like the Vestals travel around in a wagon, they're not walking around anywhere. People go to supplicate the Kumari. The girls are not staying with their families during this time, and they stay in this role as a Kumari until their first period, their first menstrual cycle. Not as long as the Vestals, it's not a, a fixed number of years, it's whenever the girl gets her first period, then she is no longer a goddess and she goes back to normal life. So like the Vestals, the Kumari goddesses have to be selected and again they undergo a series of tests. They have a period of service and then they have a life after being a Kumari goddess. It's kind of a culture shock when you are told that you are a divine being and your feet are not allowed to touch the ground to then be expected to go to math class. Um, a lot of former Kumari goddesses talk about the adjustment and how difficult it was. I imagine that it was similar for the Vestals, so I want to jump right into what life was like when you were no longer a Vestal. So because you were in such a high position for so long, it doesn't just wash easily off. So the reverence that was given to Vestals during their terms of service was given to them after their terms of service as well. Now it wasn't technically there, like they weren't officially carried around in a carpentum. They had to kind of walk places like normal people and be a little bit more integrated into society. But if you recognized someone who used to be a Vestal just walking on the street, you'd be like, oh my God, that she used to be a Vestal. You're still thinking like, wow, what a, what a holy person. Are you ever like in an airport and you see like a monk or a nun walking around and you're like, wow. I can't describe it, but you kind of have that like, oh, moment. I love when you see like a priest in the grocery store, maybe wearing like the collar, but like also a flannel. And you're like, okay, you're, you're not doing the religious thing right now, but like you're religious in general. That is what I imagine. Like if I saw a former Vestal on the street, I'd be like, wow, wow, that's a former Vestal, right? So you still get this reverence, this uh, respect. You're given a pension you are taken care of financially by the state for the rest of your natural life. And what is really interesting and what I imagine must be very difficult for a former Vestal is you are allowed to be married and you are encouraged to be married. Being married to a Vestal was another form of status acquisition for whoever your future husband was and not just him, but the whole family. This must have been so difficult for the Vestals because you spent the last 30 years being praised for your abstinence and the threat of being buried alive for any kind of sexual contact to be followed by marriage when you haven't even been around 
people all that much. You're not fully integrated into society and now you have to get married to someone you probably don't know. Now you're like probably close to 40 years old. So I imagine this was not that easy. The benefits are that you are given a pension, you're set up for life, and you're still very, very highly respected by everyone you meet for the rest of your life. So the College of Vestals lasted well into the fourth century CE. Their public funding was taken away in 382 by the Emperor Gratian. During this time, there was a lot of religious turmoil. Christianity was on the rise. Paganism was fighting for dear life. And so the public funding for the Vestals got taken away and the last recorded Vestal that we have in the epigraphic record comes from just a few years after that. I think it's 385. Yeah, 385. So that's the last we hear of them officially. If we believe the legend that the Vestal College was founded by King Numa, we're talking about a span of, of a little over a thousand years that the Vestal College was in place. So that's basically the long and short of the Vestal College. I want to conclude by just saying again how weird life must have been if you were a Vestal. You get taken away from your family at a very young age, put into the service of one of Rome's patron goddesses. You are among the most important religious and government functionaries, sometimes as young as six years old. You are given this extraordinary responsibility and all of these privileges with the caveat that you must do them or else you're going to suffer tremendous consequences. You have to keep your purity, you have to keep your chastity as the most important thing to you. And then one day, you're no longer in the service of the goddess, you've been replaced. Now you're gonna get married and get reintegrated into society 30 years later. What does life even look like for you? I don't know, what do you guys think? Let me know what you think about the College of the Vestals and what life may have been like for them. But I'm gonna wind down this video now. Thank you for watching, I appreciate it. Uh, if you liked it, you can let me know by giving me a thumbs up. And if you like this content and you wanna see more, go ahead and subscribe. I'm going to be putting out a lot more videos that have to do with ancient Greek and Roman beliefs, whether that's official state religion or magic, spell work. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.